gives me great pleasure today to present the AMP studies to harmonize protocols of the Phase 2B proof of concept trial designed to test the efficacy of VRCO1 antibody to prevent HIV acquisition. These two trials were extensive, large, complicated, and very well conducted by the protocol teams, who are listed here. HVTN704, HPTN085, the protocol team associated with the MSM and transgender person trial in the United States and South America. And HVTN703, HPTN081, the protocol team that conducted this study in Sub-Saharan Africa. My co-chair, Mike Cohn, and the co-chairs, um, Saritha Udupungati and Niratsu uh, Mgadi as well as Shelley Karuna deserve incredible amounts of credit for the data and the execution of the trial presented here. Yes, it took a very large village to do this complicated trial. The laboratory data I will present are world-class um, cutting edge um, and the analysis done by Peter Gilbert uh, and his crew. And we are thankful to all of them The top line answers to the main research questions are the following. Will long-term administration of the BNAB VRCO1 prevent HIV acquisition? And you will see that the answer is yes. Will susceptibility of the circulating community viruses to VRCO1 influence preventive efficacy by clade and by sex? And the answer is yes. And we see high efficacy among a select group of viruses, those that exhibit an IC80 in vitro susceptibility of less than one microgram per ml, that we can predict this based on um, the TZB, TZMBL assay. And can we establish a neutralizing titer of antibody concentration and serum as a biomarker of protection? The answer to that is yes. These data will not be presented in this session uh, presentation. They will be presented at the uh, conference's symposium uh, on the AMP study later on in the conference next week. The study schema is outlined here. Uh, it's a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Patients were randomized to low dosage VRCO1 10 milligrams per kilogram, high dosage VRCO1 30 milligrams per kilogram, and saline control. Given every two months, 10, in, 10 infusions, and the data covering from week zero enrollment to week 80. The Sub-Saharan Africa study uh, enrolled 1,924 women. About 1,000 of them were in South Africa, 434 in Zimbabwe, uh, 180 in Malawi, um, 150 in Botswana, 82 in Kenya, and 33 in Tanzania about 640 per group. The HVTN704 study enrolled 2,699 persons, approximately 900 per group, um, with the U.S. and Peru having the majority of enrollments. The top time message is in vitro sensitivity to VRCO1 predicts efficacy. There was consistent evidence of that VRC01 conferred preventive efficacy against viruses measured to be neutralization sensitive and did not show efficacy against viruses measured to be neutralization resistant. I'm going to present the IC80 data, which correlates and has the titus, but the data are identical for IC50 or the reciprocal of the instantaneous inhibitory potential. The top line message is illustrated in these two panels. On the x-axis, we have weeks since enrollment, and on the y-axis is preventive efficacy. The light blue line is the preventive efficacy among isolates that have in vitro sensitivity of an IC80 of less than one microgram per ml. The red, one to three micrograms, and the purple, greater than three micrograms. One sees efficacy uh, extending throughout the time period um, at around the 74%. Um, the 95% confidence limits is 46 to 90. One essentially sees no efficacy 
in the 1 to 3 or greater than 3. This is the pool trial. The graphs for the individual trial are, are identical as are the graphs for, you will see later, of, uh, of 10 milligrams versus 30 milligrams per kilogram. The next slide shows the cumulative incidence of overall HIV-1 acquisition in both AMP trials, again, pooled data. Um, um, actually, this is showing the 704 trial and the 703 trial. Um, and down here is the forest plot uh, showing both the pooled data and individual data. What this side shows is that there is um, no statistically significant efficacy that in each of the trials, the overall eff efficacy on a population basis is from 9 to 30 percent in the pool trial around overall 15 percent. Um, so when one looks at the incidence rates between the treated group versus the placebo group, um, there is no statistical difference. Now, how do I message the fact that slide one says it works and slide two says it does not work? The message is all about the frequency of which we find strains sensitive to VRCO1 in vivo. Based upon in vitro sensitivity assays done from the global panel isolated in clade C and clade B from recent isolates prior to initiation of the study. We assumed that 60 to 70 percent of the strains would be sensitive to VRCO1 at a cutoff of less than 10 micrograms per ml. In the AMP trial itself, actually 73 percent of the isolates in the control group exhibited an ID less than 10. So the predictive panels were okay. What was wrong was our assumption that we would have efficacy at 10 micrograms rather than a one microgram. And the fact is that only 30% of the viruses in the placebo group circulate in the regions, both clade B and clade C, were in vivo sensitive at high E at this one microgram per ml. We were in effect a tenfold off in estimating the in vivo susceptibility to the antibody. And this made 30% of the circulating strain susceptible, not 60% as we assumed, which affected the overall power calculations. And frankly, under these conditions, the study had low power to detect overall efficacy. These data are shown in this slide, which shows the frequency of very sensitive, sensitive, intermediate, and resistant viruses in the control group. And you see that it's 30% in the less than one microgram, to approximately 30% in the um, intermediate and 30% um, in the highly resistant. These were all pre-specified in the statistical analysis plan um, and hence uh, formed the basis of the divisions that were used in the prior slide. This slide shows that there was immunological pressure upon the infecting viral strains, and that viruses in the infected VRCO1 recipients are more resistant to VRCO1 than viruses in the infected placebo recipients. So in the pooled trials, one sees that the geometric mean IC80 for VRCO1 essentially breakthrough isolates is 8.4. Um, versus the geometric mean in the controls of 3.54. You see that here. This is the control um, having a lower geometric mean than the two treatment arms. This is two to four fold greater. Another piece of evidence of immunological pressure, so to speak, on the virus is that the viral load to the acquired strain was influenced by the treatment group, and that viral loads with, were lower in isolates with an IC80 less than one microgram per ml. This is shown in this slide, which looks at the viral load at first detection in the control group, um, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6, versus 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 in the treatment group among those isolates that broke through that have an IC less than one, one microgram per ml, an IC80. If you look at the resistance strains, again, greater than one microgram per ml, you see absolutely no 
um, evidence of a reduction in viral load um, by the treatment. So both the acquisition as well as the post-acquisition events are not influenced by antibody. In summary, we measured the autologous neutralizing viruses in vitro susceptible to VRCO1 in 162 of our 175 endpoints. This is an incredible amount of work by um, the Carolyn Williamson and, and Jim Mullins laboratory to, um, to sequence the viruses, um, to actually pseudotype the, uh, the, the virus um, and, and prepare the in vitro sensitivity testing that was done in the Montefiore lab for 704 and Lynn Morris's lab for 703. We show that in vitro viral susceptibility to the BNAB is the predictor of preventive e efficacy irrespective of gender and clade. Clade B, clade C, women, men, the data are the same. We show that the transition from sensitive and resistant is really quite sharp. And we're starting to pick up molecular markers um, uh, and signatures uh, that are associated with sensitive and resistant. And this will be discussed in the symposium by uh, Dr. Gilbert's team. And the data on in vitro sensitivity, IC80 to the BNAB and the TZMBL neutralization assay is a predictive marker for defining in vivo efficacy. Overall, the concept that we can produce and achieve preventive efficacy in humans and high-risk populations globally with the passive administration of BNAP has been substantiated uh, in these two AMP trials. It is a landmark asset that we have a neutralizing antibody assay that can be used to calibrate future studies and animal models. It is, a clear, it is clear that multiple potent antibodies will be needed to make a clinical product. Again, the virus is formidable. It is shown that again but it is tra transformative to have a tool to predict success and the target needed to achieve highly effective preventive therapy. Yes, it will require combination BNAP therapy, but such antibodies and combination targets are available and cocktails uh, can be based upon these data to move this field forward. Lastly, I would like to thank not only all the participants, but the enormous uh, site investigators and the enormous team that went into this, to my chair and co-chairs, uh, Mike Naratsu and Sri, to Shelly Karuna, to Jama Scola, who uh, essentially invented the antibody and was our partner in this, and to Carl Diefenbach and Mary Maravich, who have um, been our funding partners um, and helped in the guidance of this trial throughout the entire period of, that it was conducted. Thank you, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to present for such a large um, and impactful study, as well as um, a large number of people involved in the study per se. Thank you.